Microsoft blames the government for the ransomware attack. The MP3 is dead or just sleeping like my cat. Lyft and Waymo reportedly strike a deal and an internet connected salt shaker that is also smart and is called Smalt. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1768, recorded Monday, May 15th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get three meals free, your first purchase, and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash TNT. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we tell you everything that happened today in technology. <laughs> I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason. Now, not everything nope. outside of technology. It's just, nope. We've got to be pigeonholed into just technology. Yes, thankfully. Yes, That's, we can. We get to just talk about technology. It's probably a good thing. <laughs> I think it is today. We Shall we? We do an okay job, uh, j like, trying to cover 40 minutes of just technology. If we opened it up, who knows how long the show would be. Seriously. True. All right, let's do it. Microsoft President and Chief Legal Officer Brad Smith is once again calling for a digital Geneva convention after Friday's cyber attack that moved into China over the weekend. Writing on the Microsoft blog, Smith calls out the potential harm caused when governments, ours included, actively work to develop zero-day vulnerabilities and then them. The WannaCry ransomware attack exploited a vulnerability that Microsoft patched back in March, but that was originally stolen from United States National Security Agency, who used it for spying. More than 200,000 computers in over 150 countries have been locked by the ransomware as of this weekend. So, yeah, uh, Brad Smith stand up saying, hey, governments shouldn't do this. It's dangerous for all of us. The government is saying, you know, well, it's really the cyber criminals that are dangerous. And then there's a lot of people saying, really, it's Microsoft that's dangerous because they need to be, uh, you know, patching this stuff. And they patched it. And then a lot of people are saying, well, it's the people that haven't installed their updates that are dangerous. And then there's a lot of people <laughs> who are writing in saying, you know what, there's good reason for me not to be installing my updates. And here are my five reasons. So everyone's sort of passing the, the blame. Some people are paying the Bitcoin ransom. Other people aren't. I think companies have paid over $42,000. That was as of this morning. I think I just saw upwards of around 50,000. Wow. Or maybe they're just reporting different numbers. But yeah, maybe. it seems to be going up. And then I think it was Quartz that said that it would be higher if people understood Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> but well, like, that's true. Bitcoin is hard. It's hard to pay in Bitcoin. Right. I mean, if you, if you saw that you had some sort of ransomware attack and you had not, for, for whatever reason, you know, been connected to the technology that you're operating your business on enough to know that, hey, maybe I should update the software and that would make me more secure, then maybe you could extend that out to say, maybe there's a Venn diagram where those people and the don't understand what a Bitcoin is overlaps significantly, I would mm -hmm. imagine. That's probably very true. Yeah, yeah. There are people like just bringing in giant bags of chocolate coins. <laughs> <laughs> you What? You can bite these. Yeah. See? Uh, <laughs> uh, security industry rose 3.3% in trading today. So the hackers are not the only ones making money right mm -hmm. now. Uh, the security industry is working overtime or at least riding the wave of fear that many people have when they see the headlines that have been going all weekend long. Um, yeah, I mean, you did a really great job, I have to say, of illustrating the complexity of this in the sense that everyone but no one is directly at fault for something like this, right? Like, yes, uh, nation states should not, you know, try and find vulnerabilities in technology um, because this could happen, but they're not going to not do it. Like, of course, they're going to do it because they have to keep up with all the other nation states that are doing that. Yes, Microsoft totally should patch all of their OSs uh, in perpetuity because something of this magnitude, you know, is maybe really bad for the greater good. Uh, but they're not going to do it because, you know, they, they're going to cut off uh, old 
operating systems like XP and all these other ones, even though so many computers, you know, operating, running these businesses behind the scenes still rely on XP. So, I mean, you know, if you take a look at that, like, d does that behoove Microsoft to update for their old OSs in perpetuity forever and ever because so many people choose to run them? Like, there is no one person to blame. And that's why this is such a, an interesting and important wake up call, I think. I thought Leo said that they that they were patching it. They were, but they decided to after the fact yeah. on the realization that eh, this is kind of a big deal. Right. Maybe we should do it this one time. But right, they don't so they do that doing, normally. And right, the update that happened back in March, I mean, that didn't include XP users. But they decided today that that was news today. That I were? think that over the weekend, yeah, or, or even Friday, they announced that they were going to do that. But I guess my point there is, okay, so Microsoft updated it in March, but still a big reason why this even happened is because of all of these businesses that are still running on this legacy OS uh, that wouldn't have got that update anyway, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, Smith's argument is that you should treat them like weapons, that they are, they're cyber weapons. Yeah, and for sure. So, you know, you shouldn't stockpile them just like, you know, we, we don't want to stockpile physical weapons, uh, but, you know, that happens also. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's very true. Um, yeah, so it's, it's super complex, and I suppose we'll see... <laughs> what this leads to, which I fear is yet another attack similar to this uh, and escalations and all that fun stuff. Uh, and we'll talk about it if that happens. Netflix is taking aim at Android users who unlock and root their devices by disabling the app's visibility in the Play Store for those users. Netflix said they've switched to Google's Widevine DRM technology to restrict the app's usage on uncertified and altered devices. However, as of right now, the only restriction these targeted users are seeing is the ability to find the app in the Play Store. Those with the app installed on their device already can still use it. Uh, for now, it sounds like the plan, though, is that Netflix, uh, you know, based on kind of some of the wording of their own um, their own insight into this, is that they plan on making it so that their app will not run on those devices uh, sometime in the near future. So I, I didn't know that there was a lot of stuff you couldn't do with a rooted Android device. Um, developers of Pokemon Go also blocked um, Pokemon Go from rooted devices. So I, I don't know what else. What else can't you do? Uh, to be honest, I it's been a while since I've rooted my own device. I used to live in this world. I, I've rooted for years, and it was because it was filling in the gaps that Android as an operating system didn't cover. So it was like I rooted in order to kind of bring extra functionality to the device. A lot of people, I mean, that used to root don't anymore. So I imagine the amount of people that are doing this with their devices is less now than it has been, than it was years ago. Um, and I'm sure some of those people are doing it just for things like customization, just for things like, you know, kind of fill in the gaps like, like I was talking about. But there's also a portion of people that do that because it gives them the ability to do, you know, deeper level system things. For example, we don't really know exactly why Netflix is doing this, but it is DRM after all. So you could kind of assume that maybe this is helping Netflix feel like they are tackling an issue of, I don't know, users using the app and then offlining their video and then keeping that stored on their device, which is something that you could probably do if you're a rooted user, I'm mm. imagining. Uh, so this DRM would allow them to kind of Cut it, cut it off at the spigot and uh, just basically say, you are you're running a modified OS, so we won't even let you use the app at all so that you can't get access to those video files. So when I um, down, like I download a video, you know, uh, on Netflix, one of the... The, the offline, you set it offline or whatever. Offline, and then mm -hmm. like it just it makes it in a, enabled, you know, I can only watch it for a few days or whatever right. their time limit is. So with a rooted device, you might be able to save that. I'm guessing, yeah. I mean, you know, Netflix didn't really do a very good job of, of illustrating uh, exactly why they're implementing this DRM. Um, but that that would be my guess, is that there's, there's the potential of people kind of saving those media files. It could also be deals that Netflix makes with its partners. You know, it has to strike these deals with partners. And maybe part of that deal is that they, they you know, the, the actual partners are saying, well, you know, you're on mobile devices and we feel really wary about the the idea of you know this offline content just being you know slurped up by people uh, willy nilly and so we want better protection, but Netflix really doesn't say. But ultimately, it does prevent people who have these rooted devices, whether they're using it just for customization or whether they're using it to inadvertently get access to things they shouldn't have, uh, from using the Netflix app right at the top uh, once Netflix kind of follows through on their entire plan here. 
Is there a difference between uh, jailbreaking an iPhone and rooting an Android phone? I'd say they're probably pretty pretty comparable. It's kind of the same thing. Um, I, but I don't know. I mean, is there a big... I, I know that there's a community around jailbreaking on iPhone. I know that there's a passionate community ar around um, you know rooting Android devices. I, I would probably, yeah, guess that they're very, very similar. Mm. Well, you've seen the movie Her with Scarlett Johansson, right? If you haven't, go watch I it. I haven't. <laughs> You haven't? No, I Go need to. see it or just live it in real life. <laughs> Facebook's new initiative, Parl AI or Parlay. Uh -huh. it, it sounds like this movie in real life. TechCrunch reports that Parlay is Facebook's plan to open source the dialogue used to train machines to have conversations, also with a focus on computer vision and other fields of artificial intelligence involved in learning how to understand a task. When they say conversation, they don't just mean play my podcasts or what's the weather, but real conversations. Parlay will connect directly to Amazon's Mechanical Turk, the easily accessible remote workforce of humans being paid next to nothing to help train the AI. Jan LeCun, the head of research group, the head of the research group at Facebook behind this initiative says one of their objectives is to give you your own digital friend. Oh, <laughs> so the, the video, for, <laughs> the video for this is not as creepy as it sounds. It showed a, a lot of people who, um, blind people looking at Facebook and seeing, you know, like th the description of, you know, this, that was a picture of a tree with, you know, that was a close up picture of a baby, that sort of thing that we've talked about before, mm -hmm. like adding that metadata because people don't add it themselves when they upload pictures. So just having, you know, we, we, if you're watching this now, you'll see it's training the AI to see all these cute dogs and be able to tell what kind of dog breed they are. And then in the future, learn that. Um, so yeah, it is uh, it is one of those things that would be incredibly useful to someone that was blind and many other uses, I'm sure. Um, and also if you needed a digital friend and or a girlfriend, also useful. Yeah, right. They didn't spend any time in this promotional video talking about your, your digital uh, fake, you know, girlfriend or significant other in the form of a robot that you're talking with and sharing a life with. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, the video is great. Like you, you watch it and like, especially what we're watching right now where you're seeing, you know, these people who are blind experiencing the description of the image and you know it opens up a whole new world for them where suddenly they have understanding their mind their mind's eye is creating the image for them based on you know this dynamically created text that is being read aloud uh, through facebook's uh, algorithm so that's just uh, i think that's a, a starting point facebook also like last year was the year of the chat bot and really <laughs> i don't know maybe it's just me but it feels like the chat bot kind of jumped and then fell flat on the ground and didn't really see it live up at this point to uh, what people may have expected out of it. Maybe this helps that if you can get a chat bot to a point to where people don't feel like they're having a conversation with a bot, but actually it becomes this free flowing conversation. I think the, one of the articles that I read about this in VentureBeat kind of put it um, in the fact that like actual conversation isn't just focused on individual pieces such as talking about a movie or booking a restaurant our conversation often connects all of those dots and connects all those pieces together into this free flowing kind of uh, kind of thing and that's part of Facebook's goal here to connect all these dots between all these different topics so that when you talk to it uh, it can it can be more human and I mean, that, that is, I think, a part of the future of technology. Like, yeah, right now we only have assistants and it's, it works pretty well. Um, you know, you, you, don't, you don't necessarily want to have a conversation with your assistant. You just want them to, um, you know, play your podcast or play your music or help you with your homework or turn off the lights or those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, th there are people, we, it has been proven that people do want that sort of uh, relationship with robots. I know there was the, the robot in, or the, the AI um, I think it was in China where, you know, they had recorded all the interactions with it. Um, and, you know, 75% of the people had told it that they loved it, you know, uh, <laughs> so right. oh, I'm sure right. you would, right. you'd find that, you know, some people are joking, but you know, it, I, I do think there is that, um, also the desire for contact that people have. I mean, think about Facebook, for example, um, you know, you, people call that connection, but it really isn't. I mean, it's not really that far from, you know, talking to a robot. You're not like when you're like, oh, look at my friend from elementary school who I haven't seen in 30 years and I probably will never see, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, that's, you, you're going in steps towards that kind of, I, I think, non-connection. It's, you, you believe it's connection, but it's not really. For all you know, they could be a robot. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just posted about seeing that movie that's in the movie theater. A robot could do that.
I think. That's true. But mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, For all you know, you could be the only one living in your own Truman show. Like, who knows? True. Uh, the world is just a construct around me. I'm the only one that matters. That's This is how reality really works. He knows. He knows. <laughs> <laughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> Uh, don't cry for the MP3 file format now that its patent licensing has officially expired. It isn't going anywhere, not at least for now, but as of uh, April 23rd, Fraunhofer Institute, the creators of the MP3 audio file format, terminated its licensing program, declaring the format officially dead. Also, don't cry for Fraunhofer. They're also responsible for the AAC file format. That's the MP3 successor as digital audio standard higher quality, lower file size, more efficient audio compression, uh, all, all through and through. But I, you know, there, there isn't a whole lot of news here other than the fact that the patent expired and it seems like a passing, an official passing of the guard. Uh, but other than the fact that the MP3 as a file format changed so much about the media landscape and especially about the music industry that, I don't know, it just seems important to mention it. I don't think we cu- we talked about it uh, back in April when that happened. I don't know if I even heard of, that it happened back in April, which kind of surprises me. Uh, yeah, I mean, CNET, like you, says the MP3 is not dead. It's just sleeping. But yeah. that's what my parents told me about my cat when I was six years old. And I know Aww. now that they're lying. Aww. So I don't know what to say. Is it dead or not? Just tell know. me the truth. I, I don't think that it's dead. I don't know about your cat. <laughs> But I don't think the MP3 file format is dead. It's still heavily supported. Okay. I think a lot of people still encode into MP3 out of sheer laziness because they don't know about the benefits of some of the other ones or the fact that it's, you know, as far as like DRM we were talking about earlier, MP3 is about as undrm'd as it gets for the most part. Um, but it's just, it's it's cool to see what MP3 as a file format has brought in, in the amount of time that it existed. It, it was released in 1993. They created an it initially the file format initially to be able to broadcast higher quality audio over a telephone line um, with you know very small amounts of data. They worked on that uh, for a while, for a couple of years, nearly abandoned the development in 1995 because they didn't have a whole lot of licensing going on. And then they started to release the software that allowed anyone to convert their CDs into MP3 file format. And then you know the rest is history. Napster happened, mm-hmm. iPod happened. And all that kind of stuff. And, you know, eventually AAC uh, was what Apple kind of swapped for it. Burke has an explanation. Burke says, it just means they can't charge money for it. Patent expired. Yep, that's true. I mean, they don't, but they they said that they aren't really licensing it that much anymore anyways. So. And that is also what my parents said about my cat. (laughs) (laughs) Said your cat license expired. (laughs) We can't make any more money from your cat. So. Whatever. <laughs> the the GIF patent expired ten years ago too, yeah. and that's still alive and well. So. Whoever would have thought that mm-hmm. the GIF would be would return mm-hmm. uh, to dominance the way it has mm-hmm. with animations and stuff. We have not one but two rumors rumors about exciting apps coming to the iPhone soon. David Reddick says at Google a Google I O this week the company is planning to announce that Google Assistant will come to your iPhone soon as a standalone app. I know it's already part of Allo, and, um, but it, it's coming as a standalone app. I talked to Reddick today. He said they, are, they have a very specific reason for bringing it to the iPhone, but he could not say <gasps> other than your the tip fact, on the nose. I know, mm. that it might encourage other developers to integrate Assistant into their apps. Um, and then the other news is that Legend of Zelda is coming to the iPhone at the end of the year after Animal Crossing. So I did, I did a little informal poll to see who which people cared about more, Legend of Zelda coming to the iPhone or uh, Google Assistant coming to the iPhone on Twitter. People yeah. want Legend of Zelda more. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. So Zelda, far. Zelda's got a lot of brand cachet. Um, maybe it'll be Zelda Run, <laughs> which yeah. I would imagine would just upset people because that is not the Zelda that people want on their mobile device, but... We did talk about this on iOS today, and yeah, it's it's probably going to be something that's not as good as Breath of the Wild. Yeah, it's not as far-reaching. It would be cool. I, w- I would be way into it if they did like a mobile RPG based around Zelda. Um, I think that's what most people would hope to see if they were act- if they're actually working on bringing Zelda to the mobile platform. But you know, mobile gaming is different than console gaming, so I really wouldn't be surprised if they go in a different direction with it and upset people in the process. And why do you think the standalone Google Assistant app is coming to the iPhone? I don't know if I have any theories as far as why, other than Google does a decent job taking their their apps and services and rolling them out. I mean, I don't know. It, it, Assistant feel it 
it seems like Google has a lot to gain from getting a su assistant into more people's hands, mm -hmm. you know, and there are a ton of Google users on iOS platforms. So in some ways it kind of makes sense. It is interesting though, when you kind of compare that against this time last year, or right around the time of the, the Pixel uh, device launch last year, where Assistant was a key feature of that device and a selling point of, for why it existed and why it was special, now Assistant is being open far and wide. And I, I think he kind of saw that, like I, I kind of expected that would happen eventually, but that does in some ways take away a little bit of a competitive advantage of Google's own platform mm -hmm. versus the other. But you know, I think assistance is pretty great. I think everybody should have the ability to use it. What about if people, if Google's trying to get more people to buy Google Home versus the Amazon Echo? That could be, that could be. Although I was doing some searching before trying to figure out like, what is the, what is the benefit of me having assistant in my pocket and in Google Home at the same time that, that uh, someone on iOS currently doesn't enjoy because, you know, Home works with iOS, but they don't have Google Assistant in their pocket on an iPhone running. Is there any benefit to the fact that I do? And I can't really think of, of any real benefit there. Right. Um, so, well, maybe you would like it and then you would be like, oh, I want to be able to use this. I'm going to buy a Google Home. Potentially so. Yeah. Ex have it as a reason to maybe motivate you to buy the, the Google Home as a result. Yeah. Quick reminder. You can discuss anything that we're talking about, TNT at twit.tv. Email us. We read all your email. We don't get to respond we to all We read all your email. The, the ones that you sent to us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he just reads the one you send. I have access to everything. <laughs> and you guys are crazy. Wanna cry? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, subscribe to Tech News Today by going to our show page at twit.tv slash TNT. It is a big day for self-driving car news, and we will talk all about it after the break. But first, let's take a minute to thank Blue Apron, the sponsor of this episode. Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Every meal that you get will come with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. So the recipe card, it's laminated, it's, it, can be, it can last a long time. You can make that recipe again and again. And every ingredient comes pre-portioned. So if you need vinegar, it comes in a tiny little bottle. If you need chili powder, it comes in a tiny little package. Whatever you need, if you need an egg, it comes all prepared in this tiny little styrofoam egg holder, probably not styrofoam, something uh, more sustainable, but it, it is is protected on its way to you. If you spend a lot of time at restaurants or high-end grocery chains, you can now spend under $10 per meal for a delicious meal. That's per person for a delicious meal. Blue Apron sets the highest quality standards for their communities of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the United States. By shipping the exact amount of each ingredient required for a recipe, Blue Apron is reducing food waste. And it's less expensive too, so you don't have to buy giant bottles of things when you go to the grocery store that can cost a lot and you just use once. Their freshness guarantee promises that every ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they will make it right. Blue Apron delivers to 99% of the continental US. There's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. And if something comes up, as things always do come up, and you don't make your Blue Apron meal on the day it arrives or the day after, no worries. They come fresh and they stay fresh. We had some five spiced salmon last night for Mother's Day. It was delicious. It was not cooked by me. It was not shopped by me. My husband cooked it and Blue Apron shopped for it. And my kids ate all of it, including the bok choy, which <gasps> I never really? tried. Yes, they ate, the, they ate and loved. It was excellent bok choy. And it was made by one of their junior chefs. So maybe that was why it was so delicious because junior chefs know what kids like to eat. Yeah. You can customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences. Choose from a variety of new recipes each week or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. Here's an example of what you might get in your box if you order baked spinach and egg flatbread with sautéed asparagus and lemon aioli. Or beef teriyaki stir fry with sugar snap peas and lime rice. Or crispy salmon and roasted potato salad with pickled mustard seeds and creme fraiche sauce. That sounds really good. Or gonna say. <laughs> three cheese and baby broccoli stromboli with tomato and oregano dipping sauce. Check out this week's menu and get 
three meals free with your first purchase and free shipping. You do not pay for shipping by going to blueapron.com slash TNT. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. Don't wait. Go to blueapron.com slash TNT. Blue Apron is a better way to cook. All right. There's a veritable fleet uh, of auto tech stories today. So we thought we'd enlist the help of Sam Abu Al Samid from Navigant Research to talk through it all. Welcome, Sam. Hello, Jason and Megan. How are you today? Doing awesome. It's great to have you back. We've got not one, not two, but three stories to discuss today. So first up, a federal judge has officially blocked top Uber engineer Anthony Lewandowski uh, from any work that relates to the company's LiDAR technology. This is kind of the, re the result, or at least the latest result from the, the case between uh, Waymo and Uber. This was expected, I would say. At, at this point, I was a kind of expecting it myself. What does this tell you about the direction of the case? Um, certainly seems to indicate that the judge, uh, Judge Alsup, uh, thinks that this is, you know, there, there's definitely enough evidence here to move, to keep moving forward. Uh, he also decided that the case was not going to go to arbitration. It was going to be heard in his court. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's definitely seems to show that there's, there's some, some probability that Waymo is going to prevail in this case. And uh, just uh, as a reminder, Judge Alsup was the one who, back in the early days, of the original part of the uh, the Google Oracle lawsuit, was the one who ruled in favor of Google in that lawsuit and actually taught himself to uh, program some JavaScript, I think, and wrote some wrote some JavaScript code right. just to uh, to demonstrate, or, or it was some Java code, not JavaScript, Java code to uh, demonstrate, you know, to to show off, um, you know why you know apis should not be um copyrightable that's interesting that's right um now one thing that is happening however is that the judge is allowing uber to continue to work on its lidar so it's not shutting it off entirely it's just saying you Lewandowski, cannot be involved with it how much of an impact does Lewandowski not being involved have on the development at this stage is it pretty minimal would you say uh, probably. I mean, you know, Uber's got a lot of other engineers. I think uh, one of the parts of his ruling uh, was not only that Lewandowski could not participate, but also that uh, Uber could not use any materials or knowledge that they got from Lewandowski. And uh -huh. that could be more problematic for them. So uh, I, th I think it, it sounds like at this point, at least for now, uh, if Uber is going to continue their development, they're going to have to do it with some off-the-shelf LiDAR components and not use anything that they have put together in-house. So I've read through some of the documents, and you know, he, it seems to me that Lewandowski went to, they have a lot of evidence uh, that he really did take these documents or that someone took these documents on his behalf. I mean, they have, like, they had very uh, complicated systems set up not to get access to um, all of the LIDAR information. But, you know, they have someone logging in during this time. They have records that he put it on a, you know, a thumb drive. And, but yet, Levin, I mean, so to me, Lewandowski appears to be kind of, you know, a crook. Like he was an awesome uh, engineer and really like, you know, young and worked, um, you know, in for like built a robot in college and was great and smart. And, but now seems like he really was stealing those documents. And yet Uber still has him as an employee. Do you think that that, uh, that Uber would... I mean, why do you think Uber still has him as an employee and hasn't fired him because it makes them look guilty? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, you know, I'm I'm not fam particularly familiar with the labor laws in California. I'm I'm not a lawyer. I think I have to bring in uh, Denise Howell to talk about that one, perhaps. But um, you know, it it may be a matter of not wanting to look uh, guilty, um, and also, you know, uh, basically treating him as innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Um, so, you know, even though, you know, the, there seems to be evidence there that, that looks particularly strong, um, you know, until a judge rules definitively that he was guilty of breaking the law, uh, and stealing these documents, then, you know, he's at least going to stay on the Uber payroll, even though he's, he's apparently not allowed to work on anything related to the autonomous driving program for now. So he's basically on, on house arrest, I think with Uber. 
It's kind of like in Silicon Valley where they just put them on the roof and they just yeah, hang exactly. out there and play ping pong. But it does say that yep. an Uber engineer did testify that Lewandowski communicates with the head of uh, self-driving at uh, Uber right. every day on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Even though they said, yeah, that he wasn't going to have any input, he was still very much uh, connected to and involved with it. Well, it sounds we, like. we are we are talking about Uber here, you know, a company that's not exactly renowned for following the rules. <laughs> it's very, very shocking. True. I know. Shocking. I know. I'm, I'm amazed they would do such a thing. <laughs> well, in a move that one could easily interpret as salt in the wound, uh, Waymo and Uber rival Lyft confirmed a new cooperative deal that brings the two companies together with a shared goal of mainstreaming autonomous vehicle technology. Explain what exactly this deal encompasses for uh, Lyft and Waymo. Well, actually, to to be honest, uh, neither Waymo or Lyft have actually officially announced anything. Uh, the the original story that came out last night in the New York, New York Times by Mike Isaac, um, they had apparently got information from some sources uh, inside the companies, but nothing has been officially announced as of yet by either company. So all we can really do is speculate. Um, but it looks like, you know, based on Mike Isaac's story, that what they're doing is Waymo is going to be deploying some of, or rather, Lyft is going to be deploying some of the Waymo uh, minivans on their platform uh, at some point in the the near future uh, for testing. Uh, last week, it was that last week or the week before, Waymo announced their early rider program. Uh, where they were launching their own ride-hailing service in the Phoenix area using their their fleet of Chrysler Pacifica minivans uh, and starting to test that out. And now they're putting some of these with Lyft. And it sounds like it's similar to the deal that Uber and Mercedes-Benz announced back in March, where Mercedes is going to be deploying some of their upcoming autonomous vehicles on the Uber platform, uh, basically using Uber... Uh, Uber's platform to to allow riders to request vehicles, request rides, and then um, Mercedes vehicles would show up. Um, they'd be owned by Mercedes and um, operated just as if just as any other driver, normal driver would would show up uh, using their using the Uber platform. I think this is going to be something similar for Lyft. Uh, so Lyft users, Lyft riders can request a ride, and uh, a Waymo van will come and pick them up. I think that one of the things to keep in mind is that Lyft also has a partnership with General Motors. Uh, GM invested $500 million in Lyft last year, and they've announced that uh, Lyft is going to also be testing uh, some autonomous Chevrolet Bolts on their on their system. Uh, at some point in the next uh, year or so, they're going to start doing that. And so, but those are very different vehicles from from the minivans that Waymo is using. So it's possible that what Lyft is doing here is they're working on algorithms for how to um, how to deploy different types of vehicles on their service based on what riders request. So if you've got a group of people traveling, uh, you could request a larger vehicle like the minivan, or if it's just one or two people, they can get a Bolt. Um, or they may also be reserving the minivans for their lift line service, which is their carpooling service, and using them there. So it, we'll, we'll have to wait and see when the official announcement comes out, which uh, could be in the next couple of days. So has Lyft ever been in the self-driving car business? Like, have they ever had hired anyone, like any engineers that are involved in self-driving cars, or have they ever talked about doing any sort of self-driving gar- car technology? No, I've I've talked to people at Lyft, and they're not interested in developing the tech, the self, the auto- autonomous driving technology on their own. Um, what they want to do is partner with uh, manufacturers, with car makers that are doing it, and get them to deploy their vehicles on their service. And until now, you know, the presumption has been that GM would be perhaps the one and only doing that because of their investment in Lyft. Uh, but obviously, um, that it's clear if assuming that this announce this uh, Waymo deal is true, then you know the the GM deal is perhaps not exclusive and they're they're open to uh, working with other companies as well. I mean, I, I imagine that there's at least some some truth here. The deal, I guess, in this article I'm seeing, deal was confirmed. So all we have is a confirmation at this point between Lyft and Waymo uh, that there's something happening. And I guess we'll find out hopefully right. in the next it, few it's, days. It's been confirmed will... by sources. There's nothing, nothing's been officially announced. And, you know, no no yeah. one is talking on the record about it yet. Got it, got um, it. So, yeah, so presumably this will be happening. Um, I, I reached out to... 
uh, some of my contacts and they weren't, they weren't willing to say anything on the record yet, but <laughs> I think in the next, in the next day or so, we'll probably hear something, uh, perhaps, um, at this conference that I'm going to be at in Santa Clara over the next couple of days, uh, there is going to be someone from Lyft, uh, speaking at that conference. Uh, so, um, perhaps, uh, she'll make an announcement at that time. Yeah, that could be a good time for that. Uh, and I have to imagine that would be, that would be a good spot for Lyft to be in They're They're a distant second in the ride hailing services, you know, behind Uber, but, uh, you know, partnering, partnering up with Waymo in this uh, facility could be nothing but good for them. Uh, but in news that is confirmed, finally, uh, Google today announced a new partnership with, uh, with Audi and Volvo uh, that brings Android into their vehicles, not only Android Auto to control the infotainment system, but on a deeper level. What, what does today's uh, announcement entail exactly? Is this control over everything technology inside of these vehicles? Sort of. So this goes back to an announcement that um, Google made at CES back in 2014 when they announced the Open Automotive Alliance. Um, and they made, they announced that they were going to develop uh, a version of Android to run on car infotainment systems. Uh, so not, you know, the Android Auto that we know today um, is basically kind of a driver layer that sits on the, the vehicle head unit and communicates with software that's running on your on your phone when you connect your phone, and then it displays um, information that's projected from the phone onto the the screen in your car, um, and then it translates the the control signals, you know, whether it's a touch screen or a control knob or whatever type of interface the car has. Um, this next stage actually takes Android full blown a full blown Android stack and puts it right on. The head unit, so the the whole the whole infotainment system is running Android, um, and actually, yeah, the picture you're seeing there is actually from uh, the car my wife and I just bought a couple of weeks ago, which is a 2017 Honda Civic, which has actually been running Android for a couple of years. Um, and if you dig into the stack, you can, you can actually find the open source Android browser. And this is actually a separate program. This is not part of the Android Automotive program. Um, they Honda. Uh, uh, basically two, two. took the, the Android open source project and then built their infotainment interface on top of that. And then, oh, yeah, right. it's running old, an old version of Jelly Bean. Uh, <laughs> but what, uh, what they're putting on the Audis and Volvos is going to be brand new stuff, uh, at least Android 7. Probably by the time it actually gets to market, it'll probably be Android 8, uh, Android yeah. O. Um, and then uh, you'll have... Uh, Google will will have will have a version of their you know their default interface you know like they do with phones on on the Pixel and Nexus phones there will be a pure Android version uh, interface that you, that would be available but I think manufacturers uh, Audi hasn't shown theirs yet um, Volvo has a, has in their announcement had a um, a concept video that basically showed. Um, a version of their current interface that they have today on their census infotainment system, but it's running on Android. Uh, and uh, back at CES in January, Chrysler showed a prototype uh, vehicle with uh, an Android-based infotainment system um, that uh, it was running full-blown Android underneath, but it had um, the same interface as their current U production Uconnect system. So you Manufacturers will be able to put whatever interface they want on top of it, but it's it's running just like you've got HTC and LG and Samsung put their own interfaces on top of Android on phones. Car makers will be able to do the same thing, but presumably you'll be able to run an, um, Android apps on, right on the head unit instead of having to rely on your phone and then using the car's built-in data connection uh, to run those apps. Hmm. What about Google Assistant? There was also some talk of of putting Google Assistant in Android Auto. I mean, is it, would I be able to say like, hey, you know, Google, could take me to a restaurant that I've been to before and drive 55 miles an hour? Uh, that would, that, uh, we would assume that would be the case. Uh, if they're going to put Assistant into this, um, that you'll be able to use it the same way you use Assistant um, on a Google Home device or on a Pixel or, or other phone that supports Assistant. Um, you'll have the same sort of AI capabilities in, in the car, uh, to uh, presumably interface with whatever apps that assistant can interface with, uh, and then do the, those sorts of tasks like make a, make a reservation for you uh, with just a voice command, which would be much better than um, you know having to tap around on the screen to do the same things. Or maybe assistant on your iPhone. <laughs> dun dun dun! Calling back to Ooh. earlier in the show. Well, 
that's you know that that's the funny thing um, in the the Honda in, in our Honda. If I plug in an iPhone into it and run CarPlay on there, it's actually CarPlay running on Android. <laughs> what? Because Are you, really? Because the head unit is running Android. Yeah, that's crazy. So you can run run iOS on Android. Wow. I, my brain just exploded. Sorry if you heard that. That was my brain exploding. Uh, Sam Abuel Samid, really appreciate you taking time uh, to, to join us today. Tell people about all the cool stuff you're doing, your podcast, your site, all that stuff. Yeah, so you can find the, the stuff I do for my day job as a senior analyst at Navigant Research at navigantresearch.com. Uh, you can find our uh, the, our company blog there where all the analysts contribute to that, uh, all the reports, the research reports that we do and white papers and other fun stuff. Um, you can also find uh, the podcast I do with my friend Dan Roth where we talk about cars and uh, what what we're driving now and what we're uh, what we're likely to be riding around in in the coming years uh, at wheelbearings.media. Uh, and uh, if you're in the uh, Santa Clara area over the next couple of days uh, at the uh, Connected and Autonomous Vehicles Conference at the Santa Clara Convention Center, look me up. Come find me. I'll, I'll be there. I'm uh, chairing a, a session on autonomous cars in the morning on Wednesday and then moderating a panel on uh, uh, enterprise opportunities for connected and autonomous vehicles uh, later in the afternoon. Right on. Awesome. Have a great time. Uh, thanks again for joining us, Sam. We'll talk to you soon. Pleasure as always. <laughs> awesome. Have a great day. All right. You too. It's feedback time. Yeah. Jonathan wrote to us about our ransomware discussion with Ian Thompson on Friday. He says, everyone says to keep your OS up to date and that's fine. But few mention the many anti-malware and specialist anti-ransomware products that can help. PC Magazine just published a roundup of major projects products on May 9th. I have been using Wear Win Anti-Ransom from the venerable Wind Patrol for nearly a year now. It alerts me whenever it detects ransomware-like behavior. There are occasional false positives, but it seems to do a fine job. And the company just sent a newsletter claiming that Wind Patrol were successfully blocked last week's WannaCry attack. Unfortunately, mm. the PC Roundup overlooked Wear and other independent products. So, uh, yeah, that's, I did not know that there was specialized anti-ransomware software. And I have never used it, so I cannot attest to its... Um, ex to its uh, effectiveness, effectiveness, except for like keeping um, you from clicking on those links. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, uh, you're, I, I don't know. You know, I end up falling into the category of, yeah, but I'm on a Mac and der, 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 like I don't need to run this software, but it's probably totally not true. Right. Like everybody, everybody is susceptible. Uh, I just haven't explored all this software. So I guess PCMag.com, look for the roundup. The best ransomware protection uh, is the name of the roundup. And they have a pretty good kind of uh, picking it apart for 2017, all the options. Although, like you were saying, it sounds like not everything is in there, but it's a good place to start. It's a little overwhelming when you see all the mm -hmm. options. You're like, gosh, all I wanted to do was be safe on the internet. <laughs> Uh, coming up, more ways that IoT is invading literally everything on Earth ever. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. They're the sponsor of this episode. Uh, you do everything online. You live your life online. Why not secure a mortgage online? I mean, it's what you would expect, right? Instead of having to go you know, jump those, those manual hurdles of finding that information, going talking to someone uh, in person, face-to-face. -face. Not everybody wants to do that. Of course, you can. And if that works for you, great. Uh, but if you live your life online, maybe you want to do it a different way. You also want to find someone that you can work with uh, that you could trust as your best interest in mind. And that is Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage is going to give you a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision throughout the process. So you won't waste time searching through stacks of paperwork. With Rocket Mortgage, you can securely share your financial information to get a mortgage approval in minutes all online. You can even adjust the rate, adjust the length of your loan in real time, play around with those numbers to kind of dial in the perfect scenario for you. You can make sure that you get the right mortgage solution that's paired to your scenario, your situation. Whether you're looking to buy a home or refinance your existing mortgage, you can lift the burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage. Just make it easy on yourself. Skip the bank, skip the waiting, and go completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. That's quickenloans.com slash TNT. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. TNT's fan of the day is Maddie Peterson, who sent us this screen cap of a YouTube app saying, 
I watch tech news today on my Apple products, mostly on my iPhone 6S or Apple TV, third gen. And uh, this is obviously the YouTube app, I'm I, assuming on, on her iOS device. Uh, a picture of me with my eyes closed. Great. You're sleeping. Awesome. I'm sleeping, as I normally do at the top of the show. <laughs> I usually start the show asleep, and then I wake up throughout, and by the end, I'm fully awake. Actually, there's a weird thing on the iOS app, or any iOS apps, you're always sleeping. Oh, really? Yeah. That's, that's always you pictured sleeping. They're like, that's that Android guy. Uh -huh. Let's just make him sleep all the time <laughs> on iOS. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup uh, or us sleeping. And post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. And use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we'll find it. Don't no, we'll wake up. This it's your story, Megan. No, wake this, up. This is a good one. In case you missed it, there's a Bluetooth connected salt shaker about to launch on Indiegogo <laughs> because who among us hasn't been searching for a more interactive way to season our food? The smalt. <laughs> called the smalt spills itself it already <laughs> <at> the <laughs> world's first smart centerpiece for indoor or outdoor use it's also a speaker and a light that you control with an app and it really is a must for any quantified kitchen <gasps> they called it the quantified kitchen i uh, did not normally uh, ever call it the quantified kitchen and if uh, you ever hear me calling my kitchen quantified <laughs> then slap me oh <laughs> uh, it's a conversation starter all right they have that touted on their page, a perfect conversation starter. I can imagine the conversations you'll get into when someone starts their conversation about your internet connected salt shaker with you with built in speaker because everyone needs that. And they're so, I'm, it's probably great. I'm sure dude, it's great. Dude, how Whatever. did you get hacked? Oh, they got me through my salt shaker. <laughs> uh, didn't update my salt shaker. <laughs> Why is an internet connected salt shaker not? Like, like, what is it about an internet connected salt shaker that makes me roll my eyes? But so many other internet connected things probably don't need to be internet connected either. Yet I'm like, oh, that would be convenient. I can't, I can't, like, I can't translate that into salt shaker. For some reason, I am incapable of taking that would be convenient and putting that technology into a salt shaker successfully. Well, because you don't, there's not a problem with your salt. <laughs> there I mean, is not a problem with my salt. You're right. I guess it could, like, you could just salt, it could be the exact amount of salt that you need, but I didn't read that anywhere. Or, like, it could connect to your blood pressure monitor. I didn't read that okay. either. Um, it is a Bluetooth speaker. Okay. And, that, that I find kind of funny, actually. Uh, That's like an admission to me that, like, technology has no business being in a salt shaker. So we put a speaker in it to give it another reason to exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It, maybe it's a joke, although I don't Could think be. it is. But I mean, I, it leads me to joke. believe yeah. that it's a joke just because they're, yeah, the blog, as Brian was just scrolling through, it's about like why everyone should have a centerpiece, you know, uh, like. Well, yeah. So it's salt shaker, speaker, mood lighting. I mean, there's so many reasons for this to mm -hmm. exist, apparently. Um, although I would love to see one in person. So, hey, if you're watching <laughs> Yeah. And you're actually making this product. We'll give it a fair review on the show. I think we just did. <laughs> uh, hey, if you like your smalt, then you should let us know. TNT at twit.tv. Let us know if you're going to be pitching in on this Indiegogo campaign. Or at least just like let us know what we're missing. Because I don't know where to go with smalt from here. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. Uh, like I said, TNT at twit.tv. If you want to be part of the show, you can also uh, leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW, and find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. If you want to join us at our subreddit, you will find us there at technewstoday.reddit.com. You can comment on the stories. You can post stories if you think we might miss them. We go there and check. We check a lot of places, and one of them is Reddit. Find all the ways to subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me, I am at Megan Maroney, where you will find a lot of Snapchat filters. Yes, you will. You, you went crazy with the Snapchat filters today. Uh, I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. You won't find any Snapchat filters from me. I never log into that thing. Uh, thanks to our technical director and editor of the day. Our featured editor today is Brian Burnett. Thank you for putting up with the TriCaster today. Uh, thanks to Burke and occasional Burke chat. Burke wants us to know that uh, maybe, are you saying that it's useful because it orders your salt for you when you're running low? Yeah. Is that the use <laughs> of the smalt? Because mm -hmm. how many times have I been running low on salt and I forget to buy some new salt yeah. to put in it.
Um, have you ever used an electronic salt, like one where you push the button and it grinds itself? <laughs> no, I haven't, but they look ridiculous. My parents have them. Are they useful? Like, I, I mean, I, I mean, they do the same thing that happens when you go like this, yeah. right? Right, but maybe, I don't know why they have it. <laughs> <laughs> because it exists because it can exist, and yeah. I think that's the point, probably. So, all right, hey, everyone has their, their own thing. Uh, thanks to you for talking tech with us today and letting us know how you feel about Smalt. Uh, we will certainly read that on the show, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Your, your hand was so close that time. <laughs>